Hello and welcome back to part two. Today we're going to look at the second half of section 2.2 which deals with basic differentiation and rates of change. And to start off we're going to look at the sum and difference rules. So the sum and difference rules are actually pretty similar and what they say is if we take the derivative of f of x plus g of x that's the same thing as taking the derivative of f and adding it to the derivative of g of x. And the same will go for subtraction. So if I'm taking the derivative of the difference between f and g of x, that equals or is equivalent to taking the derivative of f and subtracting the derivative of g. So in a compound fashion, we're looking at something like part a. And example 7 says f of x is equal to x cubed minus 4x plus 5. So if we want to find the derivative, or f prime of x, we're going to take the derivative of x cubed which is 3x squared. We're going to subtract the derivative of 4x, which is going to give us 4. And because 5 here is a constant, we should know hopefully by now that the derivative of a constant is 0. So we're left with just 3x squared minus 4. Likewise, if we go and do the derivative of g of x, so g prime of x is going to equal, I have a negative 4x cubed divided by 2 plus 3 times 3 is going to give us 9x squared minus 2 and we can simplify this down to a negative 2x cubed plus 9x squared minus 2 and that will be our final answer. Next we're going to look at the derivatives of sine and cosine and these are two derivatives that you are going to have to know and memorize. So the derivative of sine is actually cosine and the derivative of cosine is the opposite of sine or a negative sine. So when we look at example 8, the function y equals 2 sine x, when we go and find the derivative or y prime, we have 2 times the cosine of x. For part b, we really have the sine of x divided by 2, or you could rewrite it as 1 half sine x. It might make it a little bit easier to do that. So to find the derivative of this, we have 1 half times the derivative of sine is cosine of x. So our final answer would be 1 half times the cosine of x, or you could rewrite that as the cosine of x divided by 2. And last but not least, part c, y prime is going to be equal to, the derivative of x is 1. The derivative of cosine is really a negative sine, so I'm, I do have to change that plus to a negative. And our final answer is right here. Next, we're going to look at our rates of change. Now, kind of a little summary um, that deals with rates of change. If you recall, we've talked about this um, several times in class, but derivatives are actually used to find a slope. Now, with a slope, we can also find a rate of change of one variable with respect to another. And then the applications that involve rates of change are going to be stuff like growth rates, production rates, water flow rates, velocity, acceleration, etc. Some common uses for the rate of change type problems is when we are describing the motion of an object. And in calc, acceleration, velocity, displacement, those are kind of classic problems. So before we do those, when we are talking about a, a motion, we're typically going to be looking at something on either a horizontal or vertical line, something that has a very designated origin and when we're talking about movement from this designated origin, if we're talking about something moving to the right or upward, if we're using a vertical line, then this is considered the positive direction. If we're talking about something that's going to the left or moving downward, this would be a negative direction. Now when we're looking at rates of change, it says the function s that gives the position relative to your origin is called the position function. So from now on, whenever you see something like s of t, we are looking at some position function or distance. If over a period of time, and I apologize this didn't come through, this should read delta t, 
the change or the object changes its position by the amount of delta s is equal to s of t plus delta t minus s of t. So kind of like your difference quotient right here. Then by the familiar formula or using your rate equals distance divided by time, you can calculate your average velocity. Now average velocity is going to be found by taking the difference or the change in your displacement and dividing it by your change in time. So displacement is measured in like feet or meters, something like that, and dividing it by seconds. So this is how you get your feet per second, meters per second, something like that for your, a unit of velocity is essentially what we're looking at. So for example nine, it says if a billiard ball is dropped from a height of 100 feet, its height s at time t is given by the position function. And the position function here says s of t is equal to a negative 16 t squared plus 100. S is measured in feet, t is measured in seconds. We want to find the average velocities over each time interval. So what we're going to have to do here is we are going to have to evaluate s at each one of these intervals or these x variables. Or I'm sorry, t, not x. So s of 1 is going to give us a negative 16 times 1 squared plus 100, which is 84. And s of 2 is going to give us a negative 16 times 2 squared plus 100, which is going to give us 36. And our units on these, remember, are in feet. So now to use the average velocity function, since I know what s of 1 and s of 2 are, I'm just going to go in and go s of 2, which was 36. So right now I'm looking at the change in s, minus 84. And we're going to divide that by the change in time, which we know is from 2 seconds to 1 second. And 36 minus 84 is a negative 48 divided by 2 minus 1, which is 1. So this tells us that our average velocity was a negative 48 feet per second. Now we're going to do the same thing for part B, and I'm going to do this off over here to the right. So now I'm going to look at S of 1, which we actually just calculated in the previous problem to be 84 feet. And S of 1.5 is going to give us a negative 16 times 1.5 squared plus 100, and that is going to give us 64 feet. So if I go to do my average velocity, we're going to end up with 64 minus 84 divided by 1.5 minus 1, which is going to give us 20 divided by 0.5, or a negative, oops, and this is a negative up here too, a negative 40 feet per second. And finally, for part C, we have S of 1, which we said was 84 feet, and S of 1.1, is going to give us a negative 16 times 1.1 squared plus 100, which is going to give us 80.64 feet. So to find our average velocity, we have 80.64 minus 84 divided by 1.1 minus 1, which gives us a negative 3.36 divided by 0.1, which is a negative 33.6 feet per second. So kind of in a summary then, if s is equal to s of t, which is a position function, then the velocity of an object is found by taking the limit as the change in time approaches zero of s of t plus delta t minus s of t divided by delta t. So, in other words, this right here is the derivative of the displacement function. So, 
to find velocity, if you know your displacement function, you can actually just take the derivative of that displacement. And that is a very key concept that you have to know. So velocity is the derivative of the position function. You can have a negative velocity, a positive velocity, or a zero velocity. However, if we are talking about speed, speed and velocity are different. You cannot have a negative speed. So speed must be an absolute value of velocity. So please keep that in mind when you're looking at examples. If it asks you to calculate speed, you have to take the absolute value of that velocity. Okay, and this is just kind of a review from Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, but the position of a free-falling object is given by this equation here, where you have 1 half gt squared plus v sub 0 t plus s sub 0. This s sub 0 is your initial height, your initial velocity, g is gravity, and g is going to be a negative 32 feet per second squared. If you're talking about feet or a negative 9.8 meters per second squared, if you're talking about the metric system. So our last example actually deals with this, and it says at time t equals zero, a diver jumps from a platform that is 32 feet above water. The position of the diver is given by, so here's our negative 16 uh, t squared, which comes from the 1 half times 32 feet per second squared, plus 16, which is our velocity, plus 32, which is our initial height. So, we want to know when does the driver hit the water? Well, our driver is going to hit the water when their displacement is equal to zero, because they have no displacement at the initial or ending point. So we're going to take our displacement function, set it equal to zero. So I have negative 16t squared plus 16t plus 32. And I can actually factor a negative 16 out, which gives us t squared minus t, um, sorry, that should be plus, minus 2. And we can actually factor this down into negative 16 times t minus 2 times t plus 1. So I'm going to end up with t equals 2 or a negative 1, well it doesn't make sense to have a negative answer, so that tells me then that t has to equal 2 seconds. So it takes the diver 2 seconds to hit the water. So then part b says, what is the diver's velocity at impact? Well the first thing we have to do is we have to calculate our velocity. And we know velocity is going to be the derivative of our displacement, and our displacement equation was negative 16t squared plus 16t plus 32. So in order to take the derivative of that, I have s prime of t is going to equal a negative 32t plus 16. And if I want to know the velocity when the diver hits the water, I know that the velocity occurs two seconds later, so I'm going to evaluate my derivative at two seconds. So I have a negative 32 times 2 plus 16, which is going to give me a negative 64 plus 16, or a negative 48 feet per second. So that's how fast, or the velocity, that the diver had when they hit the water. And this concludes our last example from section 2.2. Enjoy your fun fact. Have a good day, and we will see you guys later. Thanks.